Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Steve Thayer. I run the London Web Performance uh, User Group and um, I run Web Perf Days in London. So, you know, performance of third party scripts is a, is a really big area for us and we, we debate it endlessly. I'll quickly introduce you to the, uh, the people on our panel. Uh, sort of on my right, I've got the, um, I've got the, 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 well, if we're going to do a drug dealer analogy, we, these are the guys who are actually producing the stuff. We've got, uh, <laughs> we've got Ben Vinegar from Discus, who are, you know, discussions and comments you'll have seen, you know, on many websites. We've got Stoyan uh, Stefanov from Facebook, who is like buttons and all those kind of Facebook widgets that you like to put on your page. And over here, we've got uh, Guy Pojani from Akamai, who's sort of like the middleman, the distribution network for the, for the, for the stuff that they're, uh, that they're dealing. And then we've got, well, I was going to say addict, but that's probably not right. We've got, uh, we've got Barbara Berms from uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. She's the kind of end user, this poor person that's having all of these scripts. You know, she has to sort of deal with her, her customers, the people in the marketing team who never met a third party script they didn't like. Um, and they just want to stick all this stuff on the page, and she's got to deal with all of those issues. So we're going to kick off with a uh, with a, with a presentation from from Stoyan, just to sort of set the scene on on what third party uh, stuff means. Just remember, obviously, we've got the uh, the on slide um, stuff, so you know, try and uh, use that as much as you can. Come in, give um, uh, positive and negative feedback, give, and uh, obviously put your hand up uh, uh, via on slide if you want to talk. Thank you. Over to Stoyan. Thank you, Steve. Stephen. All right, so welcome to the third party party, uh, where we party like it's 1995, because <laughs> in many ways it is 1995 when it comes to third party widgets. So um, I'm hoping we can have a nice discussion how to bring this party to today and tomorrow. Slide, please. <laughs> Uh, so Stephen now do the same thing that I was planning to, so he stole my thunder of presenting the, the widget makers versus the consumers. I, I can only add that Stephen is also on the ops side, he's also um, on Barbara's side, right? Uh, protecting... Impartial moderator. <coughs> uh, protecting all the publishers from all the extravagance we put out there. All right, so just a quick overview. Um, Third-party content comes mostly in form of uh, script that you include on the page. Uh, it may not do anything visible, like it may be something like Google Analytics, uh, or uh, you put an iframe on the page coming from a third party, or the state of the art seems to be that you do both. You include a script that writes an iframe for you. Uh, so that we focus, um, we want to talk more about how we deal with scripts uh, and iframes. And um, yeah, we, you're including a, a JavaScript on the page coming from somewhere you don't know, you have no control over coming over the network. So what could possibly go wrong with that? Um, well, obviously, there's a security issue. And uh, Ben wanted uh, to bring up a recent attack on um, Outbrain, uh, which is a um, producer of um, the third party recommendation engine uh, so it was um, uh, attacked by by Syrian army folks who um, were able to um, uh, mess with their JavaScript and in this way affect all the pages that uh, that use their service so in, let's say for example they could uh, redirect uh, all the visitors to Washington Post to um, some other page so I think if you're an attacker, if you're a malicious uh, person, uh, why would you try to break into all these websites where you can do your one-stop shopping and break into a third party widget provider and have control over so many websites? Right, so security is obviously a, a big one. And then you have the, the SPOF or single point of failure where um, if, if a page includes a script synchronously, they, they add a single point of failure. And despite the fact that we have now good tools from Pat Minan's Spofomatic extension for Chrome, uh, and also you were able to find Spof in um, uh, using web page test, uh, but it seems like that still tends to be an issue, uh, which is pretty silly because if the third party provider is blocked in a country or an enterprise, that means your site is effectively 
are blocked as well or black holed. And then there's all the performance issues, right? Uh, anything you add on the page will add to the um, to the rendering time and, and loading time and all that. All right, so what does the state of the art of script include? Um, so despite all the, all the evangelism for using asynchronous scripts, people are still using uh, script tags. And um, sometimes the widget providers uh, on the marketing side will prefer that because it's easier. You just have one script tag instead of a little bit of code. Uh, so that's pretty bad. Um, there's currently some, some things on the crazier side, like using frame in frame. Uh, loading a JavaScript inside of an iframe, or when you write an iframe, write it inside of another iframe. So the first iframe container is blank, so it, it's not in the way of uh, the window onload event. So this is for people who uh, still care about the window dot onload and whenever it, it happens. Not as easy, but um, or friendly to copy paste, but uh, it exists. Uh, something else, um, so the thing about third-party JavaScript is they're notoriously being very uh, short-lived, 10, 15 minutes, uh, half an hour. And the reason is so that uh, the third-party provider can, can push fixes and security uh, updates and, and very quickly. Um, but that's bad for performance because we cannot use far, f far future expires header. So th there's this technique of, uh, again, using an iframe and refresh, reloading that iframe, that causes the script to be refreshed. So you can have a third-party JavaScript with a far future XPath header. And I don't know if anyone's doing it currently. Um, Sosta, all right. Uh, and then there's um, stuff that's coming up from the WebPerf uh, W3C group, um, which uh, I was hoping someone can enlighten us what's going on there with the pro progress. <laughs> um, Right, next. Oh yeah, there's this idea about um, what I call it C3PO or common third party object. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the thing is, um, so this is something uh, I put up some time ago and then Ben said that he's been thinking about the same thing, but we never really got to talk. So I think that's as good time as any. Um, and so the idea is that uh, those scripts that are included from third parties usually do the same thing. They hunt the page for any hints where the iframe should go. Uh, so they, they look at the DOM and then write an iframe and then resize the iframe because the content doesn't fit. Let's say you have a like button in German, which is a longer word. Um, so you have to resize the iframe not to take more space than needed. Uh, and every or a lot of widget providers are doing the same thing. So what if we can have uh, one script uh, that is open source and that handles this for most of the widgets? Um, so, we, so this means that the publisher can include this script uh, and package it however they want with their scripts and handle all the, um, all the widgets. So why would you download five, six scripts with I don't know, 100, 200K instead of uh, having just zero requests? So that is the idea. Uh, meanwhile, in what do we have in nearer future coming up? Um, so we have now web components. I don't know if anyone's using web components. Uh, if not, why not? Um, seems like the widgets are the, the best use case for web components. Right? Then I'm thinking, is it uh, any easier on the publisher side to, um, uh, to include a web component instead of the, the current state where you include a a div class, something, uh, and the script. There's the iframe sandbox. Um, it's really cool. Uh, should we encourage people to use it or not? Uh, what would you disallow in, in a third party widget? So there's there was the idea of uh, seamless iframes. Seems like it it's not you know it's not going anywhere, uh, going away. The same with the frame SRC doc. I don't know if uh, what's the state of that. Is it dying as well? So, talk about this. It just got a negative vote. <laughs> Content security policy, uh, it exists, it's out there. Um, what, what should we do about it? Should we encourage people to use it, uh, providers as well as publishers? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, 
what happens now, and, and Barbara can talk about this um, uh, from the publisher's perspective. So she said that sites are now bombarded by scripts. There's too much too much stuff going on, and she is also, like Stephen said, challenging anyone to stand between the marketing people and their widgets. Right. So um, how do you monitor third-party widgets? Um, do we, do people set up budgets uh, and say, okay, you have this amount of time, or K, okay, or um, uh, how do we keep the third parties in track? Also, well, how do we deal with uh, with some because not all the all the uh, third party code is is very well written, right? So, how do people deal with the scripts that have to do document write and so on? Um, Guy brought a a, a good um, question about the that uh, according to the HTTP archive, the number of domains every uh, website is using is in going up. Uh, is increasing and it can be largely attributed to third parties. So what can we do to um, uh, to fix this? Um, and he has some ideas, uh, some borderline crazy, like copying cookies from one domain to, to the other, some maybe more manageable, like what if we use the same uh, domain name for all the static resources, uh, scripts and styles and, and the sprites, and shared between all the third parties. Uh, so instead of loading something from Facebook, something Akamai.net, whatever, why don't we use something else like a common domain name? C3PO comes to mind. I think it would be C3PO.akamai.net. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mobile, right. It's finally here. Yay. Um, what does it mean for widgets? Uh, and do, is it only just making performance issues even more visible? Uh, should we do something about it? Are people using mobile uh, using that many widgets on mobile websites? Curious to know. Yeah, I think that that's all I had, um, and let's talk about all this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, thanks very much, Stone. I'm just going to do a quick poll of the panel. Guy, any quick comments from Stone's opening talk? Uh, sure, maybe I'll add a couple. One is, um, in general, third parties a little bit broader than that. I think there's some bias to think about. That every person has a bias, but there's also uh, tracking beacons, which for some websites are plentiful and actually come in often in the form of an image. Uh, and there are also actually third party components that are more inline in your page, also sort of shopping cart personalization components and, and such that are, um, I guess, kind of start to tread the line because while they're third party, they're not uh, extraneous to the sort of core flow or, or requirement of the product. But there's still a concern and all sorts of things like number of domains and reliability concerns, security concerns is still very much valid for them. Um, so that's one point. And then the second one is just to sort of highlight the, the aspect of the num number of domains. There's basically the problems with third parties that have to do with um, uh, uh, best practices around how to use them, how to write them if you're an author of them, uh, to try and get them out of the way as much as possible while still kind of keeping them uh, reasonably fast. Uh, and there's also things that are just trends, like the number of domains, uh, or like the existence of unoptimized third-party scripts that use document.write, whether you like it or not. Uh, and and those are just paths that, to me, are more interesting because there, there's no clear, as far as I know, there's no good set to uh, to advance us in the right direction to <laughs> fix those. Okay. So uh, yeah, for me, I'm basically really in the middle of both. So I want to make sure that the, the developers understand what third-party scripts uh, really could do to your page, and also, um, yeah, the business, the business side to tell them what to look out for when when asking third-party providers to provide their code. So you're saying it's it, it's not really possible to tell the marketing department they can't have that piece of code because it has a document dot write in it because they just won't understand. Exactly, you gotta you gotta explain to them what the impact actually is. Yeah, and they don't always understand that. Okay. Cool. So, Ben, as a, as a, as a provider, <laughs> what would you say about Stewian's opening marks? Um, I mean, they're really good comments. Uh, I think that, a lot, well, basically, it's been set up that this whole panel is sort of like, um, if you're a website publisher, and then third-party scripts are mean, and, and we're, we're villains, <laughs> also Stewian. Um, but I want to flip this around. Like, m maybe people aren't thinking that as a, as a third-party developer. Um, that has a, a pretty complex application that I'm serving to publisher pages. There are publishers that are doing really bad things to me, and I would love to talk about some of those. And what can we, you know? What can <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, and I don't even mean that partially as a joke, but but there is definitely, um, you know, there it can be subjects like people immediately attribute performance issues to a third-party script. That's the first place that they go. 
where I'm debugging publishers' websites, and then I attribute ba basically the performance problems back to them. Um, so I'm sort of in a, in a hard spot as well, and I think that's, I don't know, possibly worth discussing. Cool. I think we've actually got some couple of questions about how we can find and identify those sort of performance bottlenecks. But um, first question we've got from the floor is actually from Yoav Weiss. Yo oh, you down there. Hi. Um, what are the mechanisms for enabling script loading based on media queries? And is there a valid proposal? And how can we get this pushed? So this is the idea of if I've got a if I've if I've got a, a script that's just not relevant for the device that I'm running on, why am I downloading it in the first place? Things exactly like it relates to the mobile thing. I mean, if I don't show a like button on mobile, why am I downloading the script? Do you want to start taking that one? Uh, I don't know. I'm not aware of any development. Are you? Uh, is it is there a proposal going on? I started playing around with the idea. The thing it's kind of hard to de to define what happens when the media query changes. That's where if things get complicated. Do I, I want to run the script or not? But in general, do you guys think it's a good idea, or is it sh something that should be pursued? It definitely sounds interesting. <laughs> I, I'm kind of fond of it. I, so I think the notion of conditional loading, especially in responsive design website, is is a real issue. And in responsive design, we focus on images, like we spoke earlier. Uh, but um, maybe the next looming problem, if not already here, uh, is the notion of scripts. And I regularly see responsive websites download, execute scripts, and then hide them uh, because the, the layout doesn't quite make sense for them. So uh, institutionalizing or standardizing conditional loading makes perfect sense to me. And you know, using media queries seems like one way to do it. Um, not sure if there's any active conversation about it, so I guess you know we're probably going to need to uh, figure out all the different options of it. But I do think that's a good path that we need to take go down. Yeah, I think also the idea is interesting, but I'm also wondering. So why would you? What are the use cases? So you would not load, for example, a Facebook button uh, for mobile versus desktop or whatever. Um, the use cases I can think of are. Facebook button or social buttons in general, maps that may or may not be displayed because you want to go to the native map, and jQuery mobile, I mean UI frameworks, where you want to load jQuery mobile here and jQuery UI there, or th these are the use cases I have in mind. Yeah. Twitter streams, I yeah. think, are, are a common one in responsive design. Or even we're doing different ad serving for desktop versus mobile, for example, yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of comments from the floor. Kyle Simpson from Getify, did you have a, something to say on this topic? I, <coughs> I didn't actually intend to click that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say something because I, I do <laughs> have a question <laughs> since they gave me the mic. Okay. Uh, it's your time. But no, on that topic, though, so, so there is definitely a, a strong push to create declarative solutions like markup only stuff. I need to be able to express all of my intent through markup. I, I do, do just want to point out that there's a, a vast array of complex situations that you make these decisions on. For instance, I've got a simple version of a calendar widget and a complex version of a calendar widget, and I make decisions based upon bandwidth and screen size and all those other things. So I, I think it's troublesome to say this is a, a, a one-size-fits-all solution to, um, to try to encode into my markup when a script should be loaded. I feel, I'm a little biased, but I feel that's the job of script loaders rather than markup. I mean, uh, I think that's a, it's a, a valid statement, uh, but you know, there's also the statement to say that, especially in the responsive design world, there are a lot of decisions that are made based on things that could have been determined through screen properties. Um, so you know, maybe it's not 100%. You don't take away the, the, the capability or the value of loading things through, things through a more elaborate script-based loading uh, condition. Um, but you know, if it's a common enough use case and you can make it faster and easier, uh, then I still think it's a it's a worthy proposition. Uh, we've got David Stickman from Akamai, wants to make a comment. Feel free to disagree with Guy from Akamai. <laughs> At least briefly. Just <laughs> Hi, 
One of the most common use cases we see is actually tons of new domain, and people tend to do domain sharing, thinking that it's going to improve the, perform of the performance of the website. But obviously, with third party, we have 40, 50 different domains that are called by the browser. Is there any way we can give a hint of what kind of DNS resolution should be done for third party content before actually loading the third party itself? Because there is a lot of bottleneck with just DNS resolution itself. Anyone? I can take that because yeah. I know. Uh, so, so I think you know the number of domains is kind of pointed out before. Is uh, this has not been coordinated? Just kind of making sure. Um, <laughs> is uh, is uh, is a real problem. It comes into play in DNS. It comes into play with the fact that Speedy and HTTP2 and all sorts of uh, uh, pending solutions don't touch on it. They don't they don't try to optimize across domains. So I th I think it's a real problem. To, we, there is no deprioritization, as far as I know, of third-party content. You can kind of mark things beyond the async or the kind of processing aspects in the browser. You can mark something as uh, um, slower or faster. So you know, I think they contend for resources today. A part of it is about how do we optimize the number of domains. And um, yeah, today, the only tools you have for deprioritizing them is to do things like async and such. Um, okay. We're going we're gonna to come on to a later question. We're going to talk more about you know dependencies and execution time. But just to sort of stick with this the well, the original intent of this question was you know in the earlier session we talked a lot about how you were going to do media queries to decide what image you want to download uh, you know do do we need an a, an a similar mechanism for scripts or not i mean if you were to put it to the audience on a vote you say yes we need this mechanism or we don't need a mechanism for this and we can just move on is this a is this a problem that you think i'm sending way too many third party javascripts to my um so we've got, we got two votes, three votes, four votes, five votes. So people do think this is a problem. That's not just Yoav hitting the button five times. <laughs> uh, I have several accounts. <laughs> and friends. OK. I, I would just say that, I mean, we experience that people are conditionally loading our application, usually doing templates or, or JavaScript or whatever already. So I mean, if, they're, if that can just be a really nice declarative way of doing that as opposed to setting up you know, JavaScript code, I don't, I don't see the problem with that. People are doing it already, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Whatever the developer wants to do, if it's easier for them, and if media, if media queries uh, enhance the performance as well uh, in loading things, I think, yeah, if you make it easy for them to use that as a publisher again, then that's cool. I will say it's not just third party, though. So conditional loading of JavaScript on a responsive website is, uh, is broader. Third parties are a specific case of it. OK. So let's go on to the second question. We've got Tom Bouchok. Um, So this one came in anonymously as well. Um, the what WG has proposed the solution for managing script dependencies and execution time. Uh, will this solve the performance and blocking use cases? And Kyle, I believe, actually is part of that proposal, so maybe he'll have some helpful input as well. OK. So this is sort of, as I understand, it's you know, related. There are a lot of hacky ways people download scripts as comments and then you know add them dynamically to the page when they need them. There's a lot of hacks out there that are people doing to get around the the, the async um, and the blocking nature of the scripts. So you know what's happening with the working groups and and what's the best solution for this? I am not familiar with this topic. Like. <laughs> 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 Go on. Anyone from the audience who wants to take it? Yeah. Kyle? Or I can give a uh, starting right. and then maybe we'll switch to, to Kyle. But uh, um, so, so I think there's a few things there. There's there's one in kind of called resource priorities that has to do with uh, enabling lazy load and defer attributes on more objects. Those are actually f probably further along on scripts than they are on some other components. Um, uh, but there are some, there are some promise there. Um, I think there's still a lot of debates, and I heard some comments in, in a previous conversation today on uh, um, uh, on possible paths. But I think there's still a hole around how do you manage groups of dependencies, uh, so that you want to say this script needs to run after the other, but both of them combined should be asynchronous. Uh, uh, there's things around uh, association of onload, uh, triggering the onload event, um, and, uh, uh, and and an async script because an async script today would still delay the onload. So. Uh, I think on the loading process, there are some good actions. On the grouping and such, um, I would find them very promising, but I don't know if they're very far along. So since my name was brought up, I will speak up. Um, yeah, so <laughs> two or three years ago, uh, there was 
some proposals. Nicholas Zekas and I uh, kind of joined together and made some proposals on what we about um, what we call script preloading. So the idea of loading a script, but it not automatically executing the way normal scripts do, and then being able to programmatically control when that script might load. Um, and that has gone through a whole bunch of uh, starts and stops and restarts over the last three years. Most recently, about a month ago, it started back up. It turns out there's several different things, and maybe uh, Jake Archibald can also chime in. Uh, so there's some stuff with uh, navigation controller, and then there's discussions about other use cases that that might not handle. Um, I don't think I would classify us as far along in terms of implementation, but there has been an enormous amount of discussion about it, and developers do want, I think, more control over it. There's uh, one side, which is I want control in the markup. Again, back to this declarative versus programmatic control. And I think that's really one of the big uh, sticking points so far. OK. Um, Jake, did you want to say anything since you got called out? Yeah, I, I think the worst thing we've got with script loading at the moment is um, if you want to load a series of scripts without blocking uh, rendering or, or, or blocking any, any of the computing, um, but maintain the, the order of execution, we don't have that unless you use JavaScript. And we don't want to use JavaScript for script loading because then you lose the preloader. And the preloader can, you know, you can boost getting to DOM content loaded like by 20%. So we, we want something in the markup that can uh, dictate which order that, that scripts will be uh, executed and then load them asynchronously. Uh, just specifically related to third party, I do think there is another barrier, which is document.write. So when you're using a third party, when you're a, a publisher uh, and you're using a third party, uh, you need to sort of be absolutely confident 100% that that script would never ever use document.write if you're including them as, a, as an asynchronous component. Otherwise, that can mock up your entire page. Uh, and as far as I know, there is no work going on right now, but there definitely should be on doing something like that. Heck, even something like just ignoring the document.write uh, in many cases would be better than uh, uh, blanking out the page and writing only that piece instead of the entire page. Uh, but ideally, there's something a little bit more elaborate than that can, can uh, after the fact, uh, write content in those uh, sections. Uh, okay, so I see we got we got Wilson's got his uh, Wilson Page from FT Labs has got his hand up to so comment on this topic. Hopefully, hello. Um, as a web app developer, I like to have control over my resources. So, um, would it be possible that third parties like Discuss might let me bundle m those resources, uh, their third-party third -party scripts, into my JS bundle or other assets like CSS? I mean, I can see why you wouldn't want that because you <laughs> want control. <laughs> I mean, you want the control to be able to update when you want it updated. But I also don't want 100 HTTP requests going off on my page. So. Yeah. Oh, man. A lot of eyes on me here. Um, on some level, I mean, I'm a web developer, too. And yeah, I hope so. And um, and I totally, I would like to do that. Sort of makes sense. But you, you basically just hit the, the other end of it, which is um, we're just changing things at such a rapid pace that for somebody to bundle it and serve it from their own servers or whatever is just like, we can't do it. And this actually touches a little bit on some of the C3PO stuff, which is if there is, there's this, the idea is that if we had like a common library that ran on your host page, um, and then you could bundle that part, and then the stuff inside of the frames could then do whatever they wanted, and you at least got that that much out of it. Even on that po point, I could just, just, you know, inevitably I might want to do something different, and now I have to go around to thousands of websites and say, please update this library in order for us to, you to have the next version of Discuss. And that is just, it's just such a ridiculous, um, pain point to go to, you know, the way that that scales is that there's one of me and there's thousands, or I think there's there's basically millions of websites with Discuss, and to go and get all of them to upgrade all of their bundles or whatever is it would be brutal. So that's just so no. why we don't explore. Well, you, <laughs> so no. As a publisher, I mean, you can what we do. We have our libraries uh, like jQuery and all that stuff. We know will not change that often, so we compile them or go bundle them up in, in in one request, right? But then, yeah, of course, the widgets that change that could change any minute. You gotta you gotta find a solution for that. Yeah. Okay. We, we do some proxying of third-party content sometimes. 
uh, and there's a different flavor of it. So you know, on the good side, if you proxy third-party content through your servers, your CDN, um, then you you kind of regain control over some availability tests, uh, over the performance delivery of it. They may not be delivering it as kind of high quality, or uh, you know, we're not willing to spend as much uh, on the delivery controls uh, as you might be. Uh, where that really runs into an obstacle is with things like tracking. So like on Facebook, you could probably pull that off with a Facebook SDK, which is gen generic and cacheable, uh, but you wouldn't be able to do it with the iframe that figures out which of your friends recommended this because um, you know that requires some special cookies, and once you moved it off to a different domain, uh, those cookies no longer get sent. Um, so, so to me, if we are to do something like a C3PO or, or some equivalent of it, we should tackle that because our assessment, we've done some sort of um, kind of mass testing on it, and was that that really quali qualifies a lot. In order to move something to a different domain, you need to be absolutely sure that there would be no cookies associated with that request, or even if you're doing cookie syncing, there would be no cookies other than a session ID cookie uh, on that domain, and that's just a very tough restriction. So we would need to standardize how that is being handled if we wanted to go down to that path. Okay, I think we're, we'll kind of, kind of come back to that 3PO and shared cookie things in a, in, a, in a later question, but I do, I think there's an interesting question there for the, for the browser vendors, of have we actually made this problem for ourselves because we can't share cookies and domains for security reasons, we've actually created this problem and there needs to be some way to, uh, to address it because if, you know, effectively these, there's an ecosystem of people that want to share this data there is no effective mechanism that I'm aware of anyway that, that, that can do that. But next question we've got is from uh, Wes. Oh, Calvin, Calvin, sorry, Calvin. The, uh, the problem with document write was mentioned earlier and the, the need to make sure your async loaded scripts don't have any document write tags. Um, I, I work with an environment where I have hundreds of unknown vendors, including third party scripts at any time and I have no way to ever vet them all. They come from 150 different properties. And we, um, we currently use a, a tool called Write Capture to override what write, document.write does and force asynchronous loading of everything. And it's awful, and when it breaks, it gives me a headache for months at a time. Uh, we can never get rid of that. Or actually, my question is, can we get rid of that? Is there anything we can do so that we can stop having to vet these and know that they're not going to do document.write? Because the surprise is awful if it ever happens. So you want you want like a, a a flag on the browser or something to say this this page doesn't support document dot write or something. We What's add APIs all the time. Can we do the opposite just once? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we, you, you can start at start like that like that you know kill IE six campaign. You're just going to start a website kill document dot write. I would be very happy with that. <laughs> Sorry, who 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 would vote for that one? Uh, wait, what am I voting on? <laughs> Kill document dot right. Just get rid uh, of it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we could start a trade association too, in which we, you know, vet scripts. I don't know. Um, not being serious. This is a terrible joke. <laughs> so we, we, we do the same thing of the right capture as as part of the kind of optimizations we do uh, in Akamai, and you know, I, I kind of share your pain, um, and and I think. I'd like to believe that browser vendors should be able to tackle that. I don't know if any browser vendor in the crowd wants to chime in uh, by by doing some, you know, 90% accurate version of the document dot write. Just kind of write that out in spot where that script would have been after the fact, uh, because oftentimes just killing document dot write or trying to mock it up in JavaScript is, uh, you know, it's the best you we have, so we use that where we're needed. But it's extremely far from ideal. We've got to move on to the next question. So, um, the next question is actually from uh, from from Wes. Um. Um, okay, so Facebook has recently taken steps to optimize the scripts for its embeddable like button, which I think uh, step uh, you guys can speak to. But um, but how do we measure the impact of embedding these scripts? And then a second part to this question is: uh, Is the web intent uh, specification our only hope um, to kind of conquer? Uh, app linking and embedding these scripts. It, it is web intense kind of our hope for not having there are, you know these types of share buttons and scripts that are included with those. Okay. Well I might throw this question to, to Barbara actually as a as a as a consumer. I mean do you do performance testing and, and like somebody comes to you and says, I want to add this new third party script what what do you do to measure the impact of that? Yeah, I I mean I'm I'm big on performance and obviously I 
have issues when 50% of our CBC uh, desktop site is serving third-party scripts and the rest we're serving to the customers uh, is just our own content. So um, I do try to do that. Um, it is very difficult for us to make sure that all the content areas um, at CBC know about it again and how to include it. Um, so in terms of performance, I, I do I do performance tests, especially the A, B, you know, what happens before putting the script in versus after. And we've seen some really bad uh, incidents where, where ads or, or scripts like that um, slowed down our site. So uh, to make, to track those kind of things and um, give them to business and say, see, this is what could happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about from, from your side, Stu? Well, uh, what do you do to make sure yours are not so slow? Well, when, when optimizing the like button, right, then the only thing you can do is write a blog post and see, oh, see how the waterfall is so nice now. But, uh, but it was, it is. <laughs> I, it but, that uh, was good. Yeah. But, uh, I don't think we're doing anything to, to prove, okay, this is, I uh, know how, how much it reduces the average website and so on. So just trying to do the best thing and then uh, let other people measure and, and see how how it affects their websites, right? And for the, yes. Yeah. That's good. So, I mean, Ben, you said earlier that you do a lot of debugging of the customer's websites because they always blame you for the performance issue. So what's the, what are there tools, are there techniques, are there tips, is there a methodology that you follow to prove that it's the sucky customer website and not your awesome script. <laughs> that is exactly how I phrase it. <laughs> it goes over really well. Um, is there, is there, I mean, there's a ton of techniques that, I mean, are pretty well published out there that, it, that I, we're probably using. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying, we there. Um, I don't know, in my mind, like a lot of these seem, they're very, tried and true performance things like n not binding to uh, you know debouncing throttling scroll handlers and or um, um, some of the we do is we we render in chunks now so we release to the browser you know we'll render five comments release to the browser render five comments release to the browser um, we're very cognizant of um, just never tying up the, the um, UI thread um, I don't think that's something that I can you know it's just like an individual widget developer or third-party application developer, they all sort of have to do that. And I'm, I think the big issue is that they don't, or it's just it's just all over the place as to whether they do. Um, might be rambling here, you can, be, you can bring me back. Well, I guess I guess the question, you know, so if we, if we take, take an example of where you said that, you know, that you've proved that it wasn't your script that was that was blocking the site. Yeah. Was it a case of it, was it was it something that the customer was doing that was impacting your script in a negative way, and how how would you how did you prove that? How did well, I mean, the last time actually, the last time I was debugging a site, I think this was just me myself, or I brought this on m myself in the sense that I was observing that disgust was slow when scrolling through it um, on a blog, um, and actually, I think today that's actually a lot of CSS performance, which is t another topic that I will address. But uh, so I was debugging our scroll handlers and figuring it out that. Um, in this case, um, the parent website was not throttling a scroll handler, and they were activating it as you went over Discuss. So you would scroll down, and it would actually sort of chug a little bit. Um, I don't remember the purpose of it. Mm. Um, this is just a, a random anecdote of, of, of something. It might be also nice to automate that somewhere on your side, that, or on your end, that you can say, okay, publisher A is not using it properly, or don't blame, blame us uh, uh, um, you know, if the site is low. We've got Matt May from Adobe. Do you have a, a comment on, on how you measure the impact of these scripts? Uh, well, we'll hold that question then. We'll, we'll try, try and stick with the uh, try and stick with the topic. Yeah, I've got one, one comment on oh, yeah. maybe to, to throw in, which is yeah. that uh, resource priorities. Uh, sorry, resource timing. Uh, is kind of you know hopefully going to help us identify in real users uh, where to lay the blame. There are some security aspects to resource timing, but you know from from my perspective, when somebody comes to Akamai and says you know you're not making my site faster, sometimes the uh, you know the uh, the purpose is to sort of show that it's actually the third party that's on your page uh, uh, that's the cause. Um, you know, at least we have we kind of put a lot of hope in that uh, <laughs> in that front uh, to to give us clarity about whether who was who who's sort of truly to blame for the problem and therefore where should the sh solution lie. Okay. Sergey, did you want to make a comment? Actually, been working for a while with the vendors that work with us on uh, 
enforcing the contract between the groups, but I, uh, and it, one of the lines was uh, never use document, that's right. Uh, and uh, the question is, can we create or promote uh, kind of this contract between widget providers of different kind, surely, and publishers, um, and kind of help I emerging providers, which I have to deal with a lot, uh, to follow that at the same time, probably protect some widget providers' uh, needs as well. I would I would love that. I mean, we talked about that, uh, some sort of a policy, and I would love to create a policy uh, that we could give to um, the widget creators and say, okay, if you follow those steps, we would consider you using. And, and uh, I think it is important to, to make that point, yeah. So maybe maybe able to copy some of the security policies we're doing. We're talking about sandboxing from that perspective. So say, well, I'm only giving you a constrained access to certain APIs. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to use document.right. It's just going to break. Oh, there's this organization called, uh, I forgot what the name is, In Interactive Advertising Bureau or something like this. So they've released. The IAB. Yeah. IAB. They've released the document saying, um, related to ads, saying these are the best practices for ads, right? that kind of stuff. So do we need something similar for? Yeah, or just an or enforcement of it in the browser. Uh, but I don't think there's any, OK, this is the checklist that you have to follow. Otherwise, you're not, you're not given an A or. <laughs> Um, okay, so we'll switch on to the, the, the next topic. Uh, Matt, Marcus, Marcus? Stand up. All right. So this is an anonymous question. Uh, the growing use of third-party services means web pages today consume content from over 16 domains on average, creating performance and reliability problems. Uh, Speedy and HTTP2 work per domain and don't help. Can we share connections or delivery across third parties? Yeah. So I guess this is this is really the this is the point to discuss the 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 three PO idea and and you know particularly one of the areas I do deal with a lot with this is like affiliate tracking and you're trying to attribute you know the 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 affiliate referral fee to somebody and and. So all of these affiliates are coming from different domains and different affiliate tracking networks. And, you know, I've got to have that script on my page. It's part of the business model of the, of the customer I'm working in. But, you know, if all of these things were put into one centralized domain or there was an effective mechanism for sharing and synchronizing the cookies across the domains, you know, that would help me a lot. Is that something that we can, we can do or do you think that's never going to happen? Yeah, well, I really like the idea. Um, so th there's many things that we can optimize, right? First is the script that writes the whatever the widget is doing, the iframe, and so on. So uh, you know, having this as a uh, package together with the publisher's script sounds great. We have to make sure that it's absolutely future-proof because people might not upgrade it once they get it off GitHub. Um, and uh, then the other thing about the common domains Right after you have already written the iframe, right, all the static resources on that iframe, could they be sharing the same domain? That would be cool. Uh, so you don't have to deal with, so you still have to make a request to the third party provider to get the HTML, uh, any logins and that kind of stuff. But when it comes to static resources, uh, why not? Ben? So with the idea, like, maybe we have, like, 3pjs cdn.com and we just sort of everybody has like we have 3pjs slash facebook slash discuss and we just that's where we put our static stuff and then we benefit from having a single domain is that basically the idea is that trying to help me well, help me understand here yeah well, I, I think there's two aspects of it there's the standardizing of how something gets included on the page which would uh, help alleviate some of the concern with you know nascent third parties or third parties that don't put as much effort into it and then there's the delivery aspect of it, which was around um, yeah, having some shared, uh, 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 I guess there's, uh, the, the the ideal would be maybe a single domain. There are all sorts of security aspects to putting content from multiple providers on the same domain. So that might not be an option. So maybe at the very least, it is shared connections um, uh, for uh, for those components uh, to, to sort of deliver them where possible through the same entity. Um, 
Well, so, so much of this has to be done client side because it's it you know, inherently wants to read a cookie to find you know what other website that you went to so I can do my affiliate tracking and, and, and things like that. If we had some kind of shared mechanism, could we move a lot of this server side? Are there any effective server side solutions so you know I can just take all of the scripts off my page? Is that is that feasible? What would we need to be able to move some of this stuff server side? Well, I, I think you need um, for this server to be able to pull in content from multiple domains. You need, for starters, you would probably need for many of these guy uh, third-party services, you'd need some cookie syncing capability because they track different IDs. Now, cookie syncing is a solved problem in ads, so you know that can be done. Uh, but then the the second problem is non-ID cookies, uh, and and that's not at all a solved problem. So we would need basically a commitment from anybody participating in this, you know, from the Facebooks that uh, discuss on the, of, uh, the world to say, I will keep everything server side, uh, maybe even provide some supporting mechanisms for that uh, and work fully on a session ID. Uh, and then of course, then the politics kick in about who owns that ID, but that's, uh, uh, you know, we'll leave that part uh, <laughs> uh, for later. And, and on top of all of those, you would need the browser to share connections if you didn't literally land on the same domain. Uh, so you'd need to somehow have the, the browsers play ball on that front. And of course, for a publisher, it would be great to just include something or run a script somewhere and, and include all the things that you need. So that would help for sure. Yeah. I, I would say there is a lower bar or around sharing, at least, or delivering them from a standard component for providers. So if, provider, if providers had an easy way to know which resources of their third parties are things that they could pull into their content. Um, then I think that would be a big step forward. I mean, we had to do conversations with Facebook, with Google, with various others to learn that, you know, I believe the Google Analytics JavaScript library, the Facebook SDK, those components are static. But you basically don't know those without very explicit uh, statement uh, uh, from the browser vendors. Sorry, the third party vendors. No questions from there? No comments? Okay. We'll move straight on to the next one. Uh, Andre Behrens. Hi, and this is an anonymous question. If a blocking script is loaded from a domain that goes down, then this will cause my page to fail to load. How can we test and or address the single point of failure issue? Well, I guess I'll, I'll I think, go I mean, to Barbara. I mean, single points of failure? Is yeah. It, is, is this a real problem that affects your website? Yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Um, and I see sometimes even script being not properly included on the CBC domain. Um, literally, Ad hoc, you could use like Pat's spoofomatic, right, to to check how your site is behaving with third party scripts. Also, like uh, spoof check, uh, by I think the eBay team did that, so you can pull that into your continuous integration. So we can right away, uh, when somebody develops something, we could right away figure out that they're including scripts not properly, and then avoid that that potential failure. And we've had that um, happening as well, even I think last week with ads, um, where something was not properly included. And uh, we got some bad hits for that, yeah. So you're, you were able to check uh, during the build process that somebody somewhere included the block? Yeah, exactly. So it re literally checks for script. And if you, if you just put it wherever it is, it's a really cool tool. Um, and there's even, I think, a grunt uh, plugin as well that you can use. So this is, I would love to have those kind of things more integrated in our deployment so that um, basically as a developer, you can almost be dumb. So you just don't have to think about it. Um, and we catch that and you just don't, you, we're not able to deploy stuff. Important to clarify that the uh, the the spoof is the extreme scenario that kind of you know this website is down and maybe a slightly more rare one, but a mini version of it happens every time the page is loaded. Like any one of these blockers is also some sort of delay, some sort of resource contention for each one of those resources. So you know sometimes the conversation goes into nah, you know Facebook's not going to go down, which you know it's a different <laughs> conversation. But uh, um, but there is always a little bit of a penalty even for the kind of most cutting edge third parties, so getting them out of the line of fire is uh, is always a good idea. Yeah, and what, what I was saying is um, it may not be down, but it may be blocked in, in the company, or you don't want people on Facebook during you know, working hours and so on, so you effectively uh, destroy the website because you know, Facebook is blocked for some reason. Um, Carl Kinnaman, you had a... It's been answered? Okay. Cool. Uh, I was just going to add really quickly that, um, I mean, other than, I guess, like, the case where somebody just just puts in a blocking script tag, there's that problem. Um, I do think that third-party third party applications and third-party scripts 
Um, we, ha we absolutely have to be good citizens, and we have to work in situations where stuff is down or wherever. Um, I know that a, a big push that we're making in our company is that if Disgust goes down, we at least want you to see static comments that are basically not dynamic. You can't, you know, the server's not going to listen to you because maybe it's blowing up. But at least you can read comments, and for you know all intents and purposes, that's just static. It's from a CDN, and and things look okay. Um, but it's like I don't, you know, this is this is this is just this is just stuff that we have to do, and and I don't know how to if there's just like a, a hammer that everybody can just use for that. If everybody did that, uh, we'd be definitely yeah. better off. Yeah, and uh, I mean, of course, I appreciate those things that that um, providers do. Um, one of the other challenges we have is uh, when editors are actually publisher, like editors uh, writing news, being able to include widgets, and they literally take them from from a website, not thinking how to properly include it. Uh, so those are the challenge for us also to uh, sandbox that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, That's something I wanted to add uh, from your comment. Um, I'd really love to ask people to write blog posts and and do research and put us to shame. Um, so. Be you know, and just to keep the third party providers in check and say, oh, this is horrible, this is, uh, right. So um, if you s if you see some, some third party provider that doesn't provide any synchronous snippet, yeah, make a noise about it. Yeah. Uh, I, think it I think it's probably an important thing to mention is, is that it's not, you're not necessarily always criticizing them. What you're actually doing is giving them the opportunity to go to their boss and saying, look at all these people are complaining about it. And it's, that's a really effective mechanism for them to get the resources they need. They, you know, this, a lot of these guys are providers. They want to fix the problem, but they've got competing business priorities. If you're out there making a lot of noise about it, it suddenly becomes a business priority, and you really help them to uh, to address. We've only got like about four minutes left. I'm just gonna. I'm actually gonna skip one question, which we'll come back to, because I really want to get question number seven answered, uh, which from Rahul Chowdhury. Chowdhury. Okay, so this is another anonymous question. Um, what could the browser vendors provide to eliminate third-party scripts and the problems associated with them? Um, and I, I don't really agree with this question. So, <laughs> 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 so I mean, I guess the question that you know, we've got we've got people from the Chrome team, we've got people from Mozilla, we've got people. You know, I'd be very interested to hear from from those. But I mean, if if you could have one thing from a from a browser vendor guy to to help address this problem, what would what would it be? But my number one would probably be the script dependencies. Document.write, uh, close second, the ability to do a group async. Barbara? If Actually, you same, same, the document write issue. Um, like the browsers. They're my favorite. Yeah, they're <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could probably go off on this for, for a long time. Um, <laughs> Please do. So Stoyan set up that basically the way that most sort of complex widgets work today is there's a script that runs on the host page, and it usually opens up an iframe that communicate with each other. And I, in a perfect world, I would love if Discuss was just an iframe. And, 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 and there was that separation. Everyone could feel confident about it, and that would be the contract. You know it's in the iframe. You know it's not going to escape the iframe. Um, but the problem is that um, the tools for making that happen are just non-existent. There are, there, are tons, there are tons of, I don't want to say tons, but there are things that are being developed right now for further isolating iframes. There is the sandbox attribute. I, that's, that's, really break down this, uh, this iframe, there's no tools that are being developed from the other perspective, which are, let me get access you know, to some of the stuff that's happening on the parent page. Let me know that somebody's scrolling the page. Let me know that somebody's clicking so that I can close a menu that I have happened to open in my iframe. There's none of those tools right now. And, and because of that, or, or, or even very simply, I cannot resize the iframe today. Um, because there are none of those tools, we have to have this sort of dual system where I ha you know, we have to put JavaScript on your page, and that's unfortunate. Um, it would be terrific if we started looking at things from, from uh, the other side, and then maybe things could get better, I think a lot better, just, just by providing those tools. Would the web components be an answer to that? Um, I haven't looked. I, I'm, I've only like, looked a little bit, perhaps, this morning at, at, to research a little bit more about web components. So I didn't <laughs> Look like a complete fool, um, but from what I've seen is that they're still accessible by the parent page, right? Even if they're kind of hidden. Is that design yeah. by? Is there a web components person like you create the, uh, the, the 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 delegate put the hand up thing is not so. If anybody's an expert on web components, anyone? Yeah. <laughs> There's somebody over there. Yeah, Alex. 
Alex to the rescue. Hi, yeah, uh, Alex Russell from Google. Um, so the way web components work are, <laughs> it's a bunch of related specs. We designed it that way for a reason that I won't go into. But um, you can have something called a shadow DOM, which sort of hides away the implementation of your UI from the, the normal iteration order through the document. Um, and you're entirely correct that that doesn't solve the problem for you because you can still reach into the shadow DOM. That it was explicitly designed not to be a security boundary. Mm -hmm. Today, the answer is put an iframe in your shadow DOM uh, and, and use it that way. So it doesn't get you out of the, any of the sizing issues, I'm afraid. Yeah, so I like I think a lot of this new stuff, oh, that was the end thing, is is still being developed from this perspective of of of, of almost like um, widgets if like if I was Google and I had widgets that I want on all my other services and I trust those services, I feel like a lot of it is being designed from that perspective. Somebody can shut me up if I, if they want. Um, because of uh, like the security things aren't addressed or uh, there was the seamless spec that came out but it still let styles come in as if, you know, maybe for that kind of publisher they may be interested in that, but I'm not interested in that. Uh, anyways, this is, we've got that sheet that says shut up. It's time to go. <laughs> All right, so basically we've got, we got one minute left. We're going we're, we're gonna to wrap up. Uh, I think immediately after this, we're staying here for lunch. Is that right? Things to say, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to the, uh, to the people on the party. Uh, people on the party. People on the panel. People on the panel. People on the panel. People on the panel.